The Second Battle of Zurich 25 September 1799 was a key victory by the Republican French army in Switzerland led by André Masséna over an Austrian and Russian force commanded by Alexander Korsakov near Zurich. It broke the stalemate that had resulted from the First Battle of Zurich three months earlier and led to the withdrawal of Russia from the Second Coalition. Most of the fighting took place on both banks of the river limit up to the gates of Zurich, and within the city itself. Background After the First Battle of Zurich Masséna had consolidated to a defensive line behind the lower reaches of the Aare River. At this time his entire army in Switzerland consisted of around 77,000 combatants, positioned as 1st Division in the Upper Valais and the Simplon Pass, 2nd Division in the St. Gothard and the Valley of the Rus. 3rd Division Sult, right wing near Glarus, center on the left bank of the Linth, the left near Adliswil on the Zeal. 4th Division Mortier, on the Uetliberg. 5th Division Lorge, on the left bank of the limit between Altstetten and Baden. 6th Division Menard, from Baden to the confluence of the Aare with the Rhine. 7th Division Klein, formed the reserve in the Frick Thal. 8th Division Chabrin at Basel. Following the overall strategic plan, the Austrian army under the Archduke Charles was to be augmented by the 25,000 man Russian command of Korsakov, newly arrived at Schaffhausen after a 90 day march. Masséna, meanwhile, was preparing an offensive on his right flank against the Austrian positions in the Alps. On 15 and 16 August General Claude Lecorb with 12,000 men drove the forces of Strauch and Simpson from the St. Gothard, Furka and Oberalp passes in a series of violent assaults. As a distraction, on 14 August French forces under Soult made demonstrations across the Zeal below Zurich. On the night of 1617 Archduke Charles supported by Korsakov's troops launched a surprise attack over the river Aare at Gross Dottingen using boats and pontoon bridges, but his engineers misjudged the strength of the current and depth of the river, the pontoon bridge was unable to be secured and eventually after serious fighting the attack was called off. Archduke Charles and Korsakov planned no further joint action however, as following the strategic plans of the Austrian Hofkriegsrat under Baron Thugut, Charles had been ordered to move his main command north into southern Germany. Reluctantly following these instructions, he left behind a column of 29,000 men under Friedrich von Hotz, and Korsakov's command with the Swiss in the Austrian service. The plan for these two commands was to wait for the arrival of the Russian column of Suvorov penetrating north from Italy over the Alpine passes and trap Masséna in a three-point encirclement. <laughs> <laughs> Initial situation On the 22nd of August Korsakov and Hotz agreed that the Russians with 22,000 men would line the lower reaches of the river limit Aare, and Hotz with 20,000 men would occupy the Obersee region below Lake Zurich from the Linth to Glarus. On 28 August the bulk of the troops of Archduke Charles departed Switzerland. Korsakov himself arrived in Zurich the following day, quickly displaying a vein over confidence in the capabilities of his troops and disregard both for the French and his allies the Austrians. The presumption and arrogance of Korsakov were carried to such a pitch, that in a conference with the Archduke Charles, shortly before the Battle of Zurich, when that great general was pointing out the positions which should in an especial manner be guarded, and said, pointing to the map, Here you should place a battalion. A company, you mean. Said Korsakov. No, replied the Archduke. A battalion. I understand you, rejoined the other. An Austrian battalion, or a Russian company. At the end of August, the Allied army stood as follows Korsakov with 33,000 men around Zurich and the lower limit, distributed as Division Lieutenant General Gorchakov Korsakov's main body in the camp of Silfeld, between the Uetliberg and Limit, brigades of General Major Tuchkov 6, men, and General Major Essen 2, 237 men, at Wallachofen. Total with gunners 10,330 men. Division of Lieutenant General Durasov, Brigade of General Major Markov in a camp before Wining and opposite Didakon 2,000 Grenadier and 300 Cossacks. 
Brigade of General Major Pushchin in a camp at Warren Lowe's and in front of the village of Wettingen, 2,500 infantry, 1,000 Cossacks, 8 battalions, 10 squadrons. Along the right banks of the limit from Baden to the Rhine, 1,000 men. Total with gunners, 7,052 men. The cavalry and Cossacks 3, men under Major General Gudovich were distributed on the Rhine along the line of the road from Zurich to Baden. Reserve Division Lieutenant General Sacken, 5,700 men initially in a camp at Regensdorf, then along the north bank of Lake Zurich connecting to Hotz, now in Dorf, with 5,400 Austrians, on the right bank of the Rhine between Waldschitt and Basel. Hotz with 25,000 Austrians, including 3,000 Swiss, from Uzenach to Kur and Dysentis. Suvorov with 28,000 Russians on the march from Italy through the Alps. Shortly before the battle, Korsakov detached Sakin's 5,000 man reserve division to Rapperswil to reinforce Hotz in anticipation of Suvorov's approach, consequently weakening his defensive line along the limit before Zurich and exposing his line of communications. The departure of Archduke Charles gave the French a momentary superiority in numbers. Masséna was determined to exploit this and the redistribution of Austrians and Russians. His aim was to beat Korsakov and Hotz before any intervention by Suvorov. On 30 August he attempted to cross the Aare and push back the enemy before Zurich. This river crossing was unsuccessful, and Masséna now planned a crossing near Didakon with a subsequent attack on Korsakov in Zurich. On 19 September, Masséna revealed his plan to his division commanders. Lorge's division and part of Manad's would cross the limit from Didakon and attack Korsakov in Zurich. The remainder of Manad's command would occupy the enemy by demonstrating at Vogilsing. At the same time Mortier's division was to hold the attention of Korsakov's main body in front of Zurich by attacking Walishofen. Klein was to cover the Alstetten road, while the division of Sult was to cross the Linth at Bilton and prevent Hotz from assisting the Russians. All the boats available for transportation were assembled at Brugg, while a pontoon bridge was constructed at Rottenschwil to mislead the enemy as to the point of crossing. Since June, French boats had been gathered from different waters and transported over land and water. By September, 37 boats of different types were gathered in secret near Didacon. Under cover of the night of 23-24 September Artillery General Didon dismantled the pontoon bridge at Rottenschwil and transported it by convoy across the mountain to Didacon. On 24 September news came that Suvorov's troops had finally conquered the Gothard Pass. This delayed success for the Russians made the joint attack of Korsakov, Hotz and Suvorov impossible, but it persuaded Masséna to bring forward his attack from 26 to 25 September. The crossing of the limit On the evening of 24 September Masséna's troops concentrated at Didakon amounted to more than 8,000 men of Lorge's infantry division and 26 guns, all laying silently in the vicinity of the river. On the other side of the limit between Wurrenlohs and Wipkingen they were faced by only 2,600 Russians under Major General Markov, including 1,100 men under Markov himself in Oatwil Wurrenlohs, 290 men and two guns of the Misanov Cossack Regiment between the rise of the Monastery Drive and the Pine Woods, 220 men of a Grenadier Battalion on the western edge of the Pine Woods and four squadrons of Dragoons, with 550 men under Colonel Shepilev at Wipkingen. On 25 September at 4.45 as boats were rapidly launched across the limit the alarm was raised, and initial shots fired by a battalion of Gazan's advance guard brigade signaled the beginning of the attack. With prompt efficiency approximately 600 men in 37 boats crossed the limit and formed a bridgehead on the opposite bank. The crossing of the boats alerted the weak Russian outposts on the opposite bank, but despite several rounds of musketry and artillery not a single boat was sunk, or a man drowned. At this point the limit sweeps back in a wide arc to the south, allowing Masséna's artillery to fire from both sides of the river bend on the landing and deeper beyond the bridgehead. Twenty-five shots hit various buildings of the monastery. As more French crossed, firing from the left bank ceased in fear of hitting their own men, and all effort was placed into traversing the river. At five o'clock Didon directed the erection of the pontoon bridge. The French bridgehead was exposed to Russian artillery fire from the heights of Kloster Far and the Pine Woods. 
This plateau, defended by seven guns and Markov's reserves, was forthwith attacked, and after hard fighting by six o'clock, the Russians were driven back, Markov wounded and taken prisoner. Barely an hour after the first shots, the French had crossed 800 men and were in possession of the Pine Wood and the Russian camp. Behind them, the pontoon bridge was rapidly assembled and completed at 7.30. By 9 o'clock, the entire division of Lorge was on the right side of the limit with 8,000 men and a total of 26 guns. Masséna aimed to prevent the Russian right wing under Durasov joining their left at Zurich, and now quickly sent Bontemps with his brigade to gain the slopes of the mountains of the Glatt and cut the communications between Regensburg and Zurich. Bontemps' left was covered by two battalions of Quittard's brigade on the Warren Lowe's Road. All the other troops, some 15,000 men including the advance guard under Gazan, followed Chief of Staff Nicholas Udenot in the direction of Hong. Mortier's attack Meanwhile, at 5 o'clock Mortier's division had launched its feint attacks against Korsakov's main command. His left under Brunette advanced to the small plateau at Wiedekon where they were soon pinned down by superior forces. His right under Drouet drove the Russians from Walishofen, but were soon counter-attacked by Gorchakov's six battalions, assisted by William's flotilla of gunboats, and pushed back towards the UETLI. Gorchakov however, not satisfied with merely repulsing the enemy attack, pursued the French to the Uetliberg and succeeded in capturing some batteries. This gain was however to contribute to the day's disaster, as the French success on the right bank, together with Klein's advance from Alstetten onto the Silfeld plain enfiladed the right of the Russian corps, obliging Korsakov to withdraw it at 1300. The Russians fought with their accustomed bravery, but they were not well directed, and it was pathetic to see them charging up the slopes of the Albus expecting to see Suvarov at the top and calling on his name. Closely pursued as they retreated, Gorchakov's men suffered considerable loss. <laughs> Menad's feint The river crossing over the limit was successful as the Russians were too weak in their front section, and because they had been distracted away from Didakon with feints by Mortier's division at Walishofen and Menard's division at Vagilsing. Menard had succeeded in completely outwitting the Russians with his attack and also demonstrations against Brugg. From daybreak he had opened a baggage of artillery fire with all his guns in the vicinity of Baden and at the confluence of the AARE and limit against Durasov's forces, spread his remaining brigade out in full view of the enemy, and put into motion the remaining boats on the river. Durasov was completely duped by this, and stationed his troops nearly the entire day between Freienwil and Wurrenlingen. By the time he realized his mistake and marched to rejoin troops on the heights of Otlakan he found the passage barred by Bontem's brigade, and had to make a substantial detour to Zurich, where he arrived late at night. At Vagilsing Menard succeeded in throwing a small detachment over the limit on boats transported overland from the AARE while under fire, this enabled him to re-establish a flying bridge, with which he crossed part of his command the next morning. Battle closes on Zurich In Zurich, Korsakov had felt his position secure to the extent that he hadn't made a single inspection of the line, nor had he removed his baggage or hospitals to a safe distance, instead, everything was left jumbled up in the city. Roused by the cannonade, he rode out to Hong with a small detachment of troops and learned of Markov's defeat. Nevertheless he was convinced that the crossing of the limit was merely a demonstration, and that the main threat came from Mortier's attack on Walishofen. By 10 o'clock the French were advancing on both banks of the limit supported by a heavy artillery barrage. Oudinot seized Hong and the Wipkingen Heights from the weak detachment left by Korsakov, then, joined by part of the reserve, at shortly before 1500 he began attacking the Zurichberg, held by several Russian battalions. Gazan marched to Schwamendingen to cut the road to Winterthur. By this time Korsakov had finally become aware of his dangerous situation and withdrew troops from the right bank through Zurich to face the advancing Udenot, however they could only do this by filing through the narrow streets of the town, jammed with wounded and baggage. A barrage of howitzer shells from the French further increased the confusion and impeded the Russians even more. By the time they had cleared Zurich it was too late, the French had gained the mountain on that side of town and on the plains took possession of the Beckenhof country house. 
The Russians attacked bravely, but could make no impression on the troops of Lorges, supported by the Helvetian Legion. In the meantime four Russian battalions sent back to Zurich by Hotz arrived, Korsakov put himself at their head and with the help of Bachmann's Swiss Legion drove back the French to the foot of the heights of Wipkingen. Gazan however, held on at Schwamendingen. The Russian counterattacks against the Zurichberg, though incredibly brave, were inadequate in number and, instead of gaining the heights, the troops kept fighting before the gate, and charging the enemy with the bayonet among the vines and hedges, in a ground which did not admit of such an operation. As night drew on Korsakov shut himself up in Zurich, having conceded the plains to the French. Masséna summoned the town but received no answer. <laughs> Soult's attack against Hotz While all this was going on around Zurich, at the eastern end of Lake Zurich the Austrian Corps of Hotz faced the French division of Jean de Dieu Soult in the channels and marshes around the lower Linth and the Wallen Sea. For days beforehand Soult had dressed himself in an ordinary infantryman's uniform and performed outpost duty to observe the Austrian positions. The Battle of Linth River began at 2.30 a.m. on the 25th when a small group of soldiers, stripped to their underclothes, with pistols and ammunition tied above their heads and swords in their teeth, swam across the channel near Shannies. They were able to pull up rafts with ropes, and under the darkness and a thick mist which lingered all day, a whole battalion was ferried across before the alarm was raised. Similar crossings were made at Grinau Castle and Schmurakan. At 4.00 Hotz was awakened by the noise of artillery fire and rode out to find his troops fighting bravely at Shannies. He then rode with his chief of staff towards Wiesen to reconnoitre, but in the fog they ran into French troops concealed in a wood. As the two Austrians turned to flee they opened fire and both men were shot dead. News of the death of Hotz spread quickly and the dismayed Austrians now under the hapless command of Franz Petrisch fell back towards Lichtensteeg, abandoning their small flotilla of boats at Rapperswil. Further east on Soult's right flank, Gabriel Jean Joseph Molitor's brigade had been attacked by the Austrian far left flank columns under Franz Jelacic and Friedrich von Lincoln on the upper Linth. The two Austrians were unaware of the fate of Hotz's and Korsakov's forces and out of touch with each other. The French 84th Line Infantry Demi Brigade held on behind the Linth all through 25 September, then counter-attacked on the following day. Encouraged by the defeat of Hotz, Molitor's men drove Jelacic's Austrians back towards Wallenstadt. On 25, Lincoln's column appeared in the Sermftal, surprising and capturing two battalions of the French 76th Line Infantry. Lincoln's troops, which consisted of Joseph Anton von Simpson's brigade, soon found themselves opposed by a battalion of the 84th Line. By 27 September, Molitor attacked Lincoln after being reinforced by two of Soult's battalions, but the fighting was inconclusive. On 29 September after more skirmishing, Lincoln gave the order to retreat to the Rhine Valley after receiving a misleading note from a double agent and not getting any other news from Suvorov or Hotz. Actions on 26 September During the night Korsakov was finally joined by Durasov's troops, and by the corps returned by Hotz from the Linth. Now mustering 16 battalions Korsakov was determined to hold his position at Zurich until he could be joined by Suvorov. That morning he received the news of the death of Hotz. Facing the Russians, Udenot assembled all the troops on the right bank to attack the Zurichberg. Bontem's brigade was to block the Winterthur Road on the left. Lorge was to march along the limit to connect with the attacks of Klein and Mortier, who in their turn would advance by the Silfeld with Masséna at their head. By cutting the retreat of the Russians they would be driven into the lake. At dawn the Russians launched a powerful attack against Lorge's division in two lines which succeeding in driving back Bontem's brigade and retaking the Winterthur Road, thus foiling the plan to drive them into the lake. This was very fortunate for Korsakov, as at that moment Klein and Mortier were bombarding Klein Zurich, and Udenot's ordnance breaking in the Hong Gate. Terrible confusion reigned in the confines of the town, Korsakov proposed a parley, but no one paid any attention. Instead the Russians began a general retreat, leaving only a weak rearguard in the town. Though he made no effort to prevent the withdrawal, Masséna advanced Didon's light artillery to successive positions to fire on the left flank of the retreating column, which spread complete disorder through their ranks. Masséna then ordered Lorge, Bontems and Gazan to charge the center of the Russians, who defended themselves with desperation. 
Generals Sakin and Likitsuchin were severely wounded, the troops fought in isolated pockets without cohesion of any sort, at the same time Udinot broke through the limit gate, still defended by the Russian rearguard, while Klein stormed through Klein Zurich with the reserve. There was no pursuit and the Russians were able to retreat without further interference, however Korsakov determined to continue withdrawing with undiminished speed as far as the Rhine, and beyond. Wickham claims that the greater part of the Russian command were able to reach Eglisaw unmolested by the French. Nevertheless by the time Korsakov finally reached the Rhine with 10,000 remnants via Bulik and Eglisaw, he had lost 8,000 men, including 5,200 prisoners mostly wounded, 100 guns, his military chest and records. Assessment. The defeat of Korsakov came about through a combination of careful planning by the French and poor leadership on the part of the Russians. On his arrival at the front Korsakov had made no personal reconnaissances, but gave himself over to comfortable existence in Zurich and relied entirely on a misplaced faith in the superiority of his troops to all others. Masséna described him as, "...more of a courtier than a soldier." Equally, the very rigid linear style of fighting the Russians had developed in their wars against the Ottoman Empire stood against them in this terrain against the more fluid French. Accustomed as they were to seize victory by aggressive bayonet advances to their front, it never occurred to them that they might be outflanked. Korsakov and Petrish have also been strongly criticized for their rapid withdrawal over the Rhine despite very little pursuit by the French and in full knowledge that Suvorov was struggling to join them from the south. The Republican victory was undoubtedly Masséna's greatest triumph, however he too has been criticized for failing to fully exploit his success. Roquancourt, Gemini and the Archduke Charles question why Masséna on the evening of the 25th, when it became clear the Russians were concentrating against Udinot, didn't move up all of Klein's reserve and the remains of Manad's division to support the left wing and hence surround the Russians. Nevertheless the action remains a brilliant feat of arms for the French. <laughs> Aftermath Masséna, aware of Suvorov's advance toward St. Gothard, quickly shifted his troops southward. Le Corbe's division had already performed heroics in delaying the Russians at the St. Gothard Pass, and later at the spectacular crossing over the Rus at the Devil's Bridge. When Suvorov finally forced the Rus he was met by units of Soult's division blocking the route at Altdorf. Unable to break through the French lines and aware of Korsakov's disastrous defeat, the Russian general turned east through the high and difficult Pragel Pass to Glarus, where he was dismayed to find other French troops awaiting him on 4 October. In waist-deep snow, his troops attempted six times to break through the French lines along the Linth but each attack was beaten back. Suvorov had no alternative but to make his escape across the treacherous Panixer Pass which is a difficult mountain trail to this day, abandoning his baggage and artillery, and losing as many as 5,000 men, after the French victory Russia pulled out of the Second Coalition. The French extended their control of the territory of the Confederation and created favorable conditions for the attack on Austria. Under accusations of looting Masséna requisitioned enormous quantities of food, livestock and feed as well as soldiers and money. Want and misery dominated in the war-affected areas. The Second Coalition War had greatly weakened the Helvetic Republic, the consequent loss of popular support led ultimately to the 1803 Act of Mediation. On the Zurichberg up a short forest trail and a monument to Masséna and the French. On the monument in the forest both battles of Zurich are briefly described. There is another commemorative memorial at Langnau M. Albus south of Zurich to the defense of the Albus Pass. In Paris the village names of Didacon and Moudathal are chiselled on the Arc de Triomphe. In Chalonenchelucht near the Devil's Bridge is a monument to the Alpine crossing of the Russians under Suvorov. <laughs> <laughs> Notes <laughs>